And actually, the same actor who played the monster is also the mummy. The special effects makeup on the mummy is my favorite. He's got these, like, ridges across his face, these lines, these indents. And it's very simple, but it's, like, very affecting, and it, like, kind of makes your stomach turn just to look at him. I love that performance so much. It, he exudes so much fear, but also control and then emotion in his eyes. And it's a very restrained performance, as opposed to the monster. It's very physical and kind of, in a way, goofy of someone whose motor functions aren't quite there. And also the way he's reacting is very childlike. And it's complete different from the mummy, the performance of the mummy. So what will a talented actor... Boris Karloff. Boris Karloff, yeah, thank you. Universal has produced some of the best monster movies in cinema history. Frankenstein, Dracula, The Mummy, The Invisible Man, not to mention all of their contemporary versions, including films like Van Helsing. Let's break down Universal's monsters, the classic films, the modern films, and the upcoming ones. Hello, movie friends, and welcome back to another episode of Raiders of the Lost Podcast, the ultimate film and TV podcast. In today's episode, we are continuing spooky season with an episode on Universal's monsters. So Universal built its studio on their classic monster movies from the 1920s all the way up to 1960, and they have continued to make movies about monsters since then up until the present day. I think some modern great ones are The Invisible Man starring Elizabeth Moss is one of my favorite horror movies the last several years. We have some upcoming ones like The Wolfman starring Ryan Gosling. They tried The Wolfman with Benicio Del Toro, didn't quite work, but Universal for a long time was defined by the monsters. We're talking Frankenstein, Dracula, The Mummy, The Creature from the Black Lagoon, Dr. Jackal and Mr. Hyde, Invisible Man, Bride of Frankenstein. The Hunchback of Notre Dame was actually a Universal movie before it was a Disney movie. And even The Phantom of the Opera, which is one of the most famous monster movies ever, these are all incredible, creative, artistic films. They were pushing the boundaries of filmmaking as well as makeup and prosthetics. And watching them 100 years later, sometimes 80 years later, they still hold up. They're still wonderful watches during the Halloween season. I just can't wait to break them down because I adore them. Yeah, we're going to talk about the contemporary versions as well as we've had some solid reboots. I mean, The Mummy from 1999 is probably the best reboot that Universal has done, including The Invisible Man. I disagree. In I, okay, right. Let me finish the... You talked for like 77 minutes just now. <laughs> Let me get like a sentence. You said it was the best. I was just stopping that. You said one of the best. One of the best. The Invisible Man <laughs> from 2022. Or was it 2020? 2020, 2020, 2020 yeah. lockdown, COVID yeah. year. And just now I forgot my train of thought, Anthony. You're just saying that the Invisible yeah, Man is awesome. Some, we've you're had, right, we've had some great reboots as well as <laughs> plenty of successful films like Van Helsing was a decently successful film. The Wolfman was decently successful. Dracula Untold is pretty decently good. Decently successful. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, pretty successful. Renfield, bomb. <laughs> Last Voyage of the Demeter, bomb. So we've had some successful films, some bombed films. We're, all, we're getting goofy tonight. We've had some successful reboots as well as not so great ones. But overall, for the majority, they've been critically slammed. Most of these films haven't been that great when they've done them in the 21st century. Van Helsing's a lot of fun. The Wolfman had so much potential. And Dracula Untold's kind of there, but Renfield, Last Voyage of the Demeter, those were not great films. What happens is sometimes they... Sometimes straying away from the source material works it as a diff disadvantage and works as an advantage. So with the Elizabeth Moss uh, Invisible Man, that director, Lee Wenell, came up with a really fantastic concept for a reinvention of the story and the character using technology. Whereas you look at something like Hollow Man, didn't quite work. It was okay. And also Renfield. Well, Hollow Man's not technically a universal okay. monster movie. That's just so if in, I made a list of movies that are basic, it's basically the Invisible Man. Yeah, yeah. Essentially, Yorgos Lanthimos' upcoming film, Poor Things, is a Frankenstein tale. Also, there's been a couple of Fox films that have been modern takes on these because some of these stories are so old that it's in the public domain. Studios don't own the rights to some of these characters and some of these stories. However, I still think that some of the originals are better than the new versions by far. Uh, I think that The Mummy is really fantastic. Creature from the Black Lagoon. There's rumors that that's going to get remade by uh, someone soon. I think it's... No, no. James Mangold's doing the DC one, Swamp Thing. So Creature from the Black Lagoon, even though it had so many films and spinoffs, I'm not sure if there's an, a new adaptation up in the running. Well, you could argue that Shape of Water is 
basically yes. a version of Creature of the Black Lagoon, Absolutely. except a lot more romantic and more of a love story versus a creature that's obsessed with this lady on a boat. Well, that's funny you say that. It makes a lot of sense because uh, that's one of the most uh, inspiring films for Guillermo del Toro growing up was Creature from the Black Lagoon. It's one of his favorite movies of all time. But I think that, honestly, Frankenstein and The Bride of Frankenstein are two really fantastic adaptations of that character that haven't been topped. Young Frankenstein's great, but it's like a it's a spoof of it. You know what I mean? And then Hunchback of Notre Dame, it's actually really incredible filmmaking, the, the 1923 film. Huge sets, gigantic groups of characters, just really, really impressive visuals and architecture and sets built on that. Because these movies, they were, a lot of money was put into them. And if you watch these films, the filmmaking is still very limited back then. They can't do much with the cameras, but they were able to do some crane work, some dolly work, um, some tracking shots. And it's really impressive because they made up for that with remarkable sets. And like some of the sets in Dracula, some of the sets in The Bride of Frankenstein are absolutely mind-blowing. Just like I watched Bride of Frankenstein today, and I was just awestruck by the magnitude of the sets, the beauty of the lighting, the production design is just top tier because the and it really helps excel to the storytelling because they weren't able to do that much filmmaking wise because the cameras are so big and heavy they could barely move but they still made the films visually interesting and there's incredible prosthetic and special effects to use the jock dr jackal mr hyde special effect that famous shot of they managed to get it so that his face turns dark and black and hollow and and they did that just from a makeup test a makeup design so they put a, a certain kind of glass filter over the lens, and because of the certain makeup he was wearing, that glass filter, once they threw it on top of the lens, it, it showcased the un, the layer of makeup, making his cheeks and forehead very dark. And they, all, they did that all in one shot. And then on top of it all, the special effects work and visual effects work in The Invisible Man still holds up to this day. I watch that film every year, and I'm still blown away when I watch it. I'm like, how... Did they film this? When he's taking the cloth off his face to reveal, you want to see who I really am, yes. basically, with the crazy maniacal laugh. It's shocking that they made that in 1933. It blows my mind. And you got to remember, when we're talking about Universal's MonsterVerse and Universal's monster movies, it's different than the over 200 movies that have been made about Dracula, the over 100 movies that have been made featuring Frankenstein. They're, these are public domain. I mean, the original Frankenstein book that was made back in, is written in 1818 by Mary Shelley. Wow. So this is public domain stuff. Oh, my stuff. God. God. That's why there's over 200 Dracula movies. However, Universal, they don't own the rights to the characters, but they just have their own monster verse and they got such a they, their studio grew so much from these monster movies and it's pretty interesting that, you know, such big actors they get the superhero roles the last like 15 years. The big actors used to get often get monster roles, yeah. monster movie roles. It's really interesting. And I know we like to complain about franchises and sequels and reboots and origins, but all, they were but they were done. doing it in the 30s yeah. and 40s big time. There were like 7 Frankenstein movies in 10 years. There's the son of Dracula, the son of Frankenstein, Dracula's daughter, Frankenstein meets Wolfman, and then Abbott and Costello, the duo, they actually had a series of universal films where they would encounter different of the different monsters. So it's Abbott Costello meet Frankenstein, Abbott and Costello meet the Wolfman, Abbott and Costello and the Mummy. So they made so many spin offs and sequels and built these franchises. It really was the backbone of Universal. But on top of that, they were on the cutting edge of special effects and prosthetics work. And still more contemporary versions of stories similar to these are coming out. Poor Things, uh, Yorgos Lanthimos film starring Emma Stone coming out very soon in theaters in December, mid, right? Mid-December. Yes. That's December, essentially a Frankenstein yeah. movie. You know, this young woman comes to life from a mad scientist and just that's the story how that unfolds. And there's been multiple interpretations of it, but it's really interesting that with how successful Universal was with Frankenstein back in 1931 with the original, then The Bride of Frankenstein in 1935, Son of Frankenstein in 1939, Ghost of Frankenstein, Frankenstein meets <laughs> the, the Wolfman, all within 10 years of each other, 12 years of each other. They haven't touched Frankenstein since 1948 with Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. It's funny because um, growing up, we were so aware of these characters, not really the movies, but Frankenstein, Dracula, and the Mummy were, were just popular culture phenomenons and everybody knew what Frankenstein was even though even if we didn't watch the films as kids you saw him everywhere um, and ironically they kind of 
misconstrued what Frankenstein was because I grew up thinking Frankenstein was the monster. Me too. Every every yeah. Halloween costume that you got at a store is like yeah. it was Frankenstein. It was Frankenstein's monster, but it, yeah. they didn't care. It wasn't until I watched the original film where I was like, wait, oh, the scientist is Dr. Frankenstein, and then the, <laughs> the monster is just called the monster. The creature. Yeah. So it's been we've been misled about who Frankenstein is all of our lives yeah. up until like rec- when you watch the actual films. But marketing has m- always made us think that if you're dressing up as the monster, you're dressing up as Frankenstein. But there were parts of our lives in popular culture growing up, and there's even like that famous Monster Mash song. So even it if you, was the Monster, monster Mash, the Monster Mash, something, something. It was a graveyard bash, bash, the monster, bash. monster Mash. And so even if you didn't watch the films as a kid, you still were aware of these characters. And Dracula is just. I get Dracula's probably the most famous horror character. One of the most famous fictional characters yeah. of all time, if not the most famous fictional character of all time. And st- just to stay on the Monster Mash real quick, I don't know if you remember, I we remember. were at a fundraiser <laughs> when we were kids for a politician. And yeah, we were, uh, you know, we were at a stuff. fundraiser. <laughs> <laughs> we liked Gately, you know. We wanted him Gately for, for House of Reps. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> our parents took us there, obviously. I think we were, what, 11, 10? Something like that. And I sang Monster Mash karaoke. It was the first time I ever did karaoke in my life. And I... You killed it. I braved the storm and did Monster Mash. Like, no one paid attention to me because there was just a bunch of adults yeah, everywhere. Yeah, like, just some kids singing. We, like, ate, whatever. we ate all the Swedish meatballs. Then we did... <laughs> We had all the all the shrimp, uh, all the Shirley cocktails, <laughs> all the shrimp cocktails, Shirley Temple, all the Shirley Temples, <laughs> Roy Rogers, and then I was all jacked up on sugar. I sang the Monster Mash. I remember uh, you asked me to sing it with you, and I was too nervous and shy to. Y'all made fun of me because I wanted to do it, and then you did it, and then I thought it was great. And so, and so I, <laughs> and so I asked. I remember I asked, "Did you want to sing it again?" And I can sing it with you. You were like, "No, I'm good." <laughs> You were I like, need, fuck I, you. I needed you before. But <laughs> Where now, are you? But guess what, Anthony? Where I was, was Gondor? <laughs> Where was Gondor? I'm a star. I don't. I want to get off this farm. <laughs> <laughs> you totally rejected me because I rejected you first. I was a shy kid. That was the well, thing with a bunch of brothers. Not to get off track real quick, but if you have a bunch of brothers, anything you do, you make get made fun of. That's different than them. So it is what it is. But like you said, we grew up with these characters, never seeing the movies. But you know who Frankenstein was? You see him in, like, the reruns. You see him in the commercials. But everyone just knows the lore. Like, you know who Jesus Christ is as a kid. You never met him. You know who Frankenstein is. (laughs) You know who Dracula is. You know who, like, these mythological figures are in the culture. Yeah. But, like, Frankenstein, Dracula, the mummy, when it comes to horror, they're so popular. But what's interesting is that the performance of these films recently in modern times hasn't really been very predictable. And I think the problem is with monster movies... You can't spend that much money because if you're going to spend a boatload of money, you risk losing because the films never make that much. Even the very successful ones, you're talking 200 million tops. tops. Well, so the Mummy, the Tom Cruise one, that made 400 million dollars okay. on a box off. I mean, on a budget of over 200. So that might have broken even, probably, maybe not. But then you compare it to the the Invisible Man, which was made with I think 13 million, if that, and it made 200 million. But also the Mummy, the Tom Cruise version. That was a terrible movie. Yeah. Alex Kurtz, the, the Dark Universe, that was going to be the first movie. It was the first movie. It was so bad. Even though it made an okay amount of money f- compared to its budget, yeah. they shut it. They shut that in that entire verse. I, I do think that they they stand a better chance if they're made with bit mid-range budgets and not doing high budgets because the Wolfman upcoming with Ryan Gosling, It's I think it's going to get a big budget because it's Gosling. Well, it's Derek Chinfrain. It's true. But I, so I think that if they stick to mid to low range like The Invisible Man – you stand a, and the shape of water made over a hundred million dollars on a small budget. So I think that's the best route for making monster movies. I think that going too big in scale, you're risking too much because even if the films are successful, I think 400 to- is tops is what you're going to do with that, with the biggest star in the world, 400 million dollars. So I think there is a ceiling to these films. They're not going to make, you know, Barbie or Oppenheimer numbers, but because uh, universal mon- monster movies are a hard sell for mainstream, huge audiences, but you can make a ton of money if you don't invest too much. So I think that the route that Universal needs to go is let's not do a Marvel universe. Let's not mar- let's not make huge budget movies. Let's make 20 to 30 million dollar budget movies. Make them really cool and audiences will show up and even if we don't even even if we make 100 million dollars it's still a profit and we can still keep making more. Yeah, I feel like so Dracula Untold that movie made 217 million dollars 
decent amount of money off seventy million dollar budget. So it may it was probably a little successful. I mean, you counted marketing and cut for a sounds like a broke even ticket yeah. sales for a movie theater is probably broke even. Uh, the Mummy again, four hundred million dollars. Wolfman didn't Wolfman didn't make its money back. The two thousand ten version that started Benicio del Toro. That budget was about two hundred. Pulled like one seventy at the box office. So that was a that was a huge failure for them because they probably lost at least hundred million dollars. Oh yeah. And then Renfield. Seventy million dollar budget plus marketing, it pulled in twenty five million global. So that lost probably too big of a budget. Probably a hundred million dollars, maybe. Demeter, that was a bomb. Didn't even come close to its budget. So, I, but also, it's tough to, I guess, for a studio to okay a project. I mean, it's a Dracula movie. We need elaborate sets. We need a mansion. We need uh-huh. huge production costs. Same thing with a Mummy movie. The Mummy in nineteen ninety nine. They're trying to recapture that magic, but it's tough to do that when you're more focused on just spending so much money versus let's write a great story because the mummy the new version from 1999 it's pretty similar to the original version a it's lot very, of different ways yeah it's very similar emotep's the mummy the main one of the main characters he's trying to bring back his yeah, love he's trying to, bring, trying to bring back his love and he does he has this spell that he that is recap that is said that brings emotep back to life and then he does that spell to bring his love back to life a little different here and there but overall Pretty similar story arcs to the new Mummy in 1999, although it didn't have fucking Brendan Fraser in it. <laughs> or Rachel Weisz. Or a cool-ass <laughs> sword, but... <laughs> but the Mummy... Emotep. The Mummy in 1999, it's just a really good movie. Yeah. It's just a great action-adventure flick, and it's perfect. It's like the closest thing to Indiana Jones besides Curse of the Black Pearl, and we'll, yeah. we may never get movies like that again, but they knew what they were doing. So, you actually made a clip about Van Helsing, in our TikTok, and you got a lot of hate for it. Well, because I said that it didn't make a lot of money. It wasn't yes. successful. We were, we were explaining why we didn't think it, why we thought it didn't make that much money. We said that it, you know, it was a little too much in there. It was too much CGI. It was too over bloated. And what's weird is you got, we got so much hate about people saying this goaded movie, best movie ever. What are you guys talking about? What are you smoking? Well, I like Van Helsing. Yeah. People saying, why don't you like this movie? But I'm the, like, I love Van Helsing. But what's weird about the internet is I looked on the letterbox, it's got like 500 rating, reviews. Uh, 500 reviews yeah. on Letterboxd? Like nobody, nobody's watched it Whoa. in the last 10 years. I might be wrong. It's extremely low review. It's like, it's strange that you we got attacked. That's like as many as reviews as Midnight Ruin. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it's strange that we got attacked for a movie that clearly none of these people have 8, seen. 8,000 reviews. 8,000 8, reviews. That's not it. For that's a $200 not, million dollar movie. That's not that many reviews. Not that many, many people have watched it in the last 10 years. And it's, it's odd that we got so much hate for it. I think people might have remembered that they liked it, but they clearly haven't seen it. I mean, what we explained from our perspective, obviously this movie came out in 2014. It fucking slapped when we were 14 years old. I loved it when I, I mean, I'm sorry, 2004, we were 14. <laughs> I wish I was 14. We were 2014. 14, came out in 2004, and it was awesome. I had yeah. a, We saw it like six times on TV, including we theaters. We fucking loved it, yeah. Every time it was on TV, you are like, oh, Van Helsing's on. Hell yeah, we're going to watch that whole thing. I love Van Helsing, but you know, when you look at it, I watched it like five years ago in my 20s, and had a different perspective on film and more of a focusing on production and storytelling and stuff like that and really analyzing movies like we have in the last several years. And it's not, it, it could have been a really, really great movie. It's got so many great qualities. The cast is excellent, but I think it was just overstuffed with monsters. It, I mean, have Dracula, sure. Have Van Helsing as the werewolf, sure. But then we have Frankenstein's monster. We have tons of vampires. We yeah, have Dracula building an army. Yeah. It's just, just have Dracula. Kate Beckinsale is hot as hell in this. That's all you need. And then Van Helsing. That's really all you need. You don't need Frankenstein's monster. I think they were too tempted to get every universal monster in there yeah. to then make a verse out of that. Maybe that was their plan. That Let's just focus on a smaller story. They're just Dracula being Dracula. Now, there's something that – there's a, a TV series that pulled it off. It's called Penny Dreadful with uh, Ava, Ava Green and fucking – what's his name? From Josh Hartnett. As well as uh, Timothy Dalton, great cast, and so it's Penny Dreadful, ba- inspired by the Penny Dreadful magazine. From You're the saying ne- dreadful, so weird. Whatever. Penny Dreadful, <laughs> Penny Dreadful from the Penny Dreadful magazine. It was famous in like the 30s and 40s and something like macabre and horror magazine about short stories in in the horror genre. And it, it was it's just two seasons, but I watched it and it's fantastic. They managed to weave in all of the famous monsters, all the famous creatures really well into a really cohesive and wonderful narrative and you even get like dorian gray as a character so they got everything in the horror genre and they just wove it together in this really great tv series so if anyone who's interested in these stories and they haven't seen penny dreadful i highly recommend checking out penny dreadful and they were able to do it because it was two seasons of television it wasn't a a two-hour movie 
So they were they had a huge amount of characters, but they had the time to take you really take your time with the narratives and slowly bring the arcs in and out of each season. And they did a wonderful job with that. So that TV series, excellent job. Unfortunately, didn't get enough viewership, so they canceled it after two seasons. But definitely check it out if you like horror movies and haven't seen that one. But then there's movies like, you know, The Hollow Man with Kevin Bacon, I remember loving as a kid. But I watched it as an adult, and I'm like, oh, this movie is pretty it's bad. Like, 10% it's like ten percent of Rotten Tomatoes. Pretty, pretty ro- it was pretty bad. <laughs> but ultimately, modern day, The Shape of Water has got to be the best creature feature that's been made. I mean, without with hands down, without a doubt, it's number one. It won Best Picture. It's Guillermo's one of Guillermo's greatest films, and it really is just a sensational film. I, w- I was actually very happy when it won Best Picture. I know a lot of people were like, oh, the Fishman movie, what? That won Best Picture, but I thought it was really beautiful, a wonderful film. And one of this, one of the like the strongest entries in his amazing filmography. So I would say The Shape of Water is the strongest uh, monster movie we, we've had this century. And we had so much potential with the dark universe that ended up again ending after one movie, The Mummy, came out. And there was that publicity photo that Universal released with Tom Cruise, Javier Bardem, Russell Crowe, Johnny Depp, and Sofia Boutella. Now Alex Kurtz was the head of the dark universe. He directed and wrote the first film for The Mummy, and he was overseeing all these projects. And after The Mummy, it was so bad that they just canceled everything. Now, Tom Cruise was basically like the new Brendan Fraser in a lot of ways. He he wasn't like a monster. He wasn't like a main – he wasn't like a a lore character from the past. Uh, Russell Crowe was Dr. Jekyll, so he's actually in The Mummy. Javier Bardem was Frankenstein's monster, was going to be. Johnny Depp was going to be the Invisible Man. And then Sofia Boutella was obviously the mummy in The Mummy. And this publicity photo got a ton of excitement going for this dark universe – I mean, it was canceled, and ironically, this publicity photo was completely photoshopped, by the way. They weren't all standing there together. Oh, really? Yeah. Damn. So people thought, oh, they got all six, all five of them together in this that one That actually photo. makes a lot of sense. Very busy actors. Man, Very I, in-demand actors. I mean, I'm sure it's tough to get Johnny Depp on set for a photo shoot. Man, I, were, I really would have liked to see Javier as the monster, as well as Johnny as the Invisible Man. I think Johnny could have done the crazy, maniacal Invisible Man really well. I think so, too, because the Invisible Man is such a fascinating character, and it obviously happens in the Hollow Man. It happens in the newer one, where obviously it's technology-based in the new one, and it's chemical and scientific and biolog- biological-based in the other vi- other versions, where once this man discovers the secret and makes himself in- invisible, I like the original because he just starts off invisible. Like there's, it, Oh, yeah. It's like opens up. That's a great point. Covering his face up already, o- opening scene, where... Um, this person, once they get this invisible quality, they start to go insane with the power of it and the potential of it and wanting to bring like a reign of terror around the world with them forever. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a really fascinating aspect about the Invisible Man. It's because... I So Invisible Man, I think, is just such a, a miracle of a movie. And it's a really fascinating character. It's, it, I think out of all of them... I mean, it might be my favorite monster in the universe, MonsterVerse, because... The original 1933? The, ori- the, original, the original is my favorite monster movie. That's my favorite That's a good one. pick. I like that. You, excluding Jaws. No, no, but like yeah. Universal yeah. Monster. Universal movie. Monster, yeah. Even though Jaws is Universal. That's, well, so, technically, <laughs> so the thing is, technically, Universal kept making monster movies, but the universe of monsters technically only refers to the films from 1923 to 1960. Everything else, it's just Universal movies. But they kept making monster movies. Jaws is a monster movie. Yeah. They just they stopped that like that title after this after 1960. But for the universe, the, for the monster verse, the original 1933 Invisible Man is my favorite. It's just really incredible filmmaking. It's a great story, but it's the character. You, we don't see him doing the transformation. We don't see him as like a scientist. Like, oh, I have this idea. Everyone's like, you're crazy, and he does he does it on his own, and he becomes invisible. He does. That's not how the movie starts. The movie starts with him already wrapped up in bandages. He's a very strange, mysterious person, and he orders a hotel at like a bed and breakfast, and then mayhem ensues from there. We already see that he is invisible. I thought it was just, it was so great to start that because most monster movies in that kind of regard, it starts with the scientist coming up with the idea and then doing the idea. But I like how the invisible man, he's already done it. We're seeing the aftermath of the experiment, which I thought was just so brilliant. No, I, I agree. It's a great character because, like, the madness that's created within it. And then the Hollow Man, there's something in the chemicals he's taking as well, the drugs he's taking that makes yeah. his mind go insane. Whatever, whatever go psychotic. Whatever yeah. it is, it makes him go insane. But, like, the, the man, the, the original Invisible Man, he goes insane as well. Not so much insane, but he goes mad because he's— pa- Mad with power. With power. That's what it is. It's like 
He goes mad with power and thirst for being able to do whatever he wants. He wants to rule the world. He sees himself as, like, better than human now. Whereas, you're right, the Hollow Man with Kevin Bacon, it was, a, it was like an after effect, side effect of the drugs he's He's he like a given. serial killer now. Exactly. He, he, he became psychotic and murderous. And then, in The Invisible Man, the Elizabeth Moss one from 2020, it's not so much he's psychotic or ch he hasn't really changed at all. He's just found a new way to terrorize Elizabeth Moss's character, and he's already he, he always was that deranged and that and that crazy. So it's really the the suit gave him more power and more freedom to um, carry out his wishes and desires. I would say that Frankenstein's probably my favorite of the original Universal monster movies. I love the character of Frankenstein, and I like how they changed it up in The Bride of Frankenstein, where The Bride of Frankenstein. Even though the title character is The Bride, she doesn't really show up until the third act of the film. Really. Until like the last eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great movie, and they changed it where in the first Frankenstein movie, he's just this giant meat monster that can't speak but has thoughts, self-conscious to an extent, but is kind of just a murderous mach machine. But he's really a child deep down because he's got he's a damaged brain that they've reanimated, not, a, not an intact human brain that they've reanimated. So he, you know has the tendencies of like a dog in a lot of ways like he's just shown aggression so he treats aggression with aggression and, and it's then, very tragic he's beaten he's tortured yeah, he's chained and up and then the scene yeah. where he finds the little girl by the lake and she's throwing flowers in the pond he doesn't understand that oh this is a flower this is nice he picks up the little girl and throws her in the pond thinking like oh this is going to be a nice fun thing as well accidentally kills her <laughs> doesn't know what he's doing whereas in the next one he's more in, he's in more intelligent he can speak and they're trying to make him a spouse, uh, a spouse without procreation. It's really interesting. A great metaphor for for Bride of Frankenstein is that these two men create life, and then they create life without that can't procreate. So it's like a great ir ir irony. It's an abnormal brain. That's an, what it is. An abnormal yeah, brain. Abnormal brain. Yeah. So there's, and then young Frankenstein has the great joke of when uh, Igor goes to the 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 hospital to get the brains there's the normal brain and then there's the abnormal brain <laughs> <laughs> and he breaks the normal brain <laughs> and then he's like which brain did you get <laughs> <It's fr> <laughs> <laughs> and the original is actually fritz yeah fritz yeah, yeah not igor it's funny because you we grew up with like the archetypes of igor being this bald hunchback like crazy guy but in the films, the original is just Fritz. He's just like an assistant. No, he's got a fucked he's up. He's got a hunchback, but he's not like really crazy. He's got he's look, he looks like a normal dude. Yeah. Just has a crazy smile yeah. and a hunchback. But then in Young Frankenstein, that's where we get that archetype of like bald with like crazy eyes and like just very strange mannerisms. And that's one I would love to see redone. And we are getting a Guillermo del Toro Frankenstein movie probably in 2025, maybe the end of 2024. They start production filming on it. In February 2024, the cast is absolutely stacked. We have Christoph Waltz, right, as well as Andrew Garfield, Andrew Garfield, Oscar, Oscar Isaac, Isaac, and who is the actress? Mia Goth. Mia Goth. What a cast oh, yeah. for Guillermo del Toro's Frankenstein. I just I wonder who plays Doctor Frankenstein. I'm so curious. I think it's pretty clear that it will probably be Christoph. My guess. I mean, no, because Mia Goth will be will be playing his wife. My guess is. Uh, Mrs. Frankenstein, and so I'm guessing that it'll be Oscar Isaac is playing Dr. Frankenstein, or Garfield, and the other one's playing Frankenstein's monster. Well, I, think I feel like Garfield would be a good Frankenstein, because he's got, like, a, a tall, slender yeah, body yeah. in that, like, a tall, slender head. He even kind of has the head frame of, like, a Frankenstein. You mean the monster? What did I say? I'm, I'm sorry. The creature. <laughs> See, you're, See, you're my, my whole life. My whole life. <laughs> the creature. I think... Cause, cause Frank Dr. Is, yeah. Sorry, I think Fra I think Garfield will play the creature. The monster? Yes. So it's the monster, and then the creature is the creature from Black Lagoon. And I bet you that he falls in love with the wife. That's interesting. Yeah. It seems like a Guillermo del Toro storyline. Christoph Waltz, I think, is too old to play any of the characters, because Dr. Frankenstein's always been a pretty young character. Yeah, true. Henry's pretty young in the first film. He's, very, he's like an up-and-coming trying to push the boundaries of, of science. But you know what I mean? Garfield's got, like, a long head, so it kind so of... So he already looks like the monster, is what say, you're saying? But, like, Oscar Isaac doesn't... He doesn't have, like, that long head shape. He's got a rounder head. I, I think that... If, they're, <laughs> if he's trying to make it look like the original to an extent. I think Garfield could do a great job with uh, physical acting. He's a, I think he's a very talented physical actor. Uh, <laughs> uh. <laughs> and actually, the same actor who played the monster is also the mummy. Yeah. Great actor. Right. And the, 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 the special effects makeup on the mummy... It's my favorite special effects makeup. It's really 
He's got these like ridges across his face, these lines, these indents. And it's very simple, but it's like very affecting and it like kind of makes your stomach turn just to look at him. And that performance, I, I love that performance so much. It, he exudes so much fear, but also control and then emotion in his eyes. And it's a very restrained performance as opposed to the monster. It's very physical and kind of in a way goofy of someone whose motor functions aren't quite there. And also the way he's reacting is very childlike. And it's complete different from the mummy, the performance of the mummy. So what a, what a talented actor. Boris Karloff. Boris Karloff. Yeah, thank you. Speaking of monsters, the giant spider over oh there. Oh my you god, see it's you huge. see that thing? It's coming for Anthony. Kill, You're gonna I'm kill it, it over there? No, Boris Karloff. He's terrific, and I, I I also love the the makeup for the mummy, especially. I know we're spoiling movies from the 1930s, so Got sorry. <laughs> but um, I love the ending when the curse gets reversed. The curse gets reversed, <laughs> and so he goes back to being dead. Basically, yes, so he goes yes. from because he's in the film, the mummy. He gets the the curse. I mean the uh, the the things recited, whatever you want to call it, the spell. This, yeah, the, the ritual, incan the incantations yeah. recited. And he comes to life after being a mummy, and then he he disappears for is it like ten years? Several years, yeah, ten years, something like that. He disappears, and he comes back. He's fresh, man. He looks like he's got a, he's got a tan. He's been drinking a lot of water. <laughs> he's been like eating in, a lot of people. He's been in Cancun. He's just been chilling, man. He's been surfing. He looks great for surfing. His, <laughs> he looks really good for his age, <laughs> for four thousand for two thousand years old, and then. The ending of the film, he reverses after the second after the spell is destroyed, the paper's destroyed, and then he goes back to being dead, and his skin just basically shivels up in a lot of, in a really cool way, similar to how they filmed the Wolfman with the transformation with his yes, feet. Yes, yes, a, a slow dissolve, a couple of dissolves. Yeah, and then I mean, the the special effects and visual effects are great. This, the makeup in Hunchback of Notre Dame is great, but the Phantom of the Opera makeup is amazing. The actor who played the Phantom actually did the makeup himself i can't then off the top of my head i can't remember his name um but he actually on the original the original it was uh the guy who played the wolfman's father wasn't it uh so blah blah blah, blah, blah. hold on i got it right here uh i'm sorry lon cheney lon cheney then lon cheney jr is the yes. wolfman so lon cheney actually designed the makeup for the phantom of the opera himself and that's like the most grotesque um it, it, it kind of scary looking makeup where he doesn't even look like a human at all um, it's really it, that's just a fantastic film as well, uh, but I just think that monster movies make for great symbolism for humanity, uh, great metaphors for uh, many of the issues and good and bad within uh, our kind, and then also it just creates an ability for so much creativity with the filmmaking and so much creativity with visual effects and special effects. Even still to this day, you can do stuff that's never been done before. You can create scares that you could never think of, like the paint scare in The Invisible Man oh in the attic. What a great, so what a great good. scare! Because like, spoil it by that. It's I'm so such good. a, I'm so, so tired of jump scares, and modern modern horror films rely so heavily on music to scare you. Like it's really the music that scares you most of the time. Like the rising strings or like very jarring music, it gets your, gets you to react to it just as much as like a jump scare does. So I, in a lot of ways, I feel like. Uh, horror films can kind of cheat a little bit with the music and it's just for me I'm like they're just they're not doing it for real but that's a scare there's no music at all at all do you remember how I reacted yeah you jumped we watched, on the couch <clears throat> jumped off the couch yeah <clears throat> I think I jumped on my feet no music no jump scare no nothing it's just sh sh they hold the shot of I screamed yeah it's a, it's a brilliant shot because they they hold it well, don't spoil it don't spoil it all right it's a great yeah. invisible man if you haven't seen it you gotta watch it ASAP it's terrific for when it comes to the reboots of the Universal Monster movies, it's one of the best, hands down. Oh, yeah. I, I totally agree. And the scares, you know, the old movies aren't that scary, but there are still some great moments of horror. Bride of Frankenstein has some great kills, and you're just like, holy shit, he's really killing people. I mean, he's got quite the kill count in the first Frankenstein yeah. movie. He kills like six people. Yeah, and I think the mummy is pretty scary. Dracula has some good scares for sure, but really it's, um, it was scary back then. You know, we got to look at things in context. You know, we're talking about 80 years ago. 100 years ago it's not going to be scary to us now but in the context of the population back then when they watched these movies these were like thrills and shrill and, and shrills yeah shrill sure thrills and shrills <laughs> <laughs> like these were the scary movies of their day meanwhile the reboots are just not very scary at all i mean the wolfman I was really hoping that would be a great film, but it wasn't very scary. I think it relied a little too much on CGI. 
there are some good parts to it. And obviously, I think Benicio was a perfect casting for the Wolfman. And Anthony Hopkins is terrific in that movie as well. Emily Blunt in a pretty early role for her before she really blew up. But that movie just fell short of expectations. It just was, it was medium. You know, it was it was, it was okay. It was un, it was forgettable. That's the problem with it. Whereas yeah. I was so excited about it. We were amped. Great for that score movie. too. But that movie let me down big time. And I think that's a character that they can really nail. If 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 Chiffrons and Ryan Gosling get to make the Wolfman for Universal, I think they'll pull off something really special, something so good that we can get maybe one or two or three of these films because the Wolfman. I think we need a new movie. Frankenstein, we're getting it. Bride of Fa- Frankenstein, that's another movie that's in development. So let's talk about some of the movies that are being developed. Bride of Frankenstein's in development? So there's a script being written by David Kep. Oh, wow. So David Kep, we've talked about quite a bit. We talk, oh, He's obviously... Recently, yeah. Yeah, we, he's written Star Wars, Indiana Jones films. He still writes regularly. But he's been working on our script for Bride of Frankenstein. Obviously, Guillermo del Toro's Frankenstein next year. Chloe Zhao is making a Dracula film, so she calls it original, futuristic, and a sci-fi western, but that's still in development, and she's still writing that. And then Radio Silence, the team behind the the new Scream films, they've been tapped to make an untitled monster movie for Universal, rumored to be Dracula's daughter. Then we have... This reminds me of uh, American Psycho, but with uh, Mila Kunis. <laughs> was she her sis, his sister or something? I can't remember if there was a familial connection. I think there might have been. I thought it was just some random girl. Oh, maybe. I didn't maybe. know. I don't know if they were related. That movie was so bad. American Psycho 2. Holy crap. Uh, Dark Army. So in 2019, Deadline reported that Paul Feig, the guy who made Bridesmaids, was working on a new monster movie for Universal called Dark Army, which was said to be based on an original idea. According to him, the project will include characters from Universal's classic monster library and original c- characters created by Feig. He is still trying to get a budget for that film. He might have to do a couple of rewrites to try to get a shorter, smaller budget. And then right now, there's a Van Helsing movie being re- written by Julius Avery, who just did Overlord. So Universal, even though they dropped the ball on their dark universe, they got some things cooking in here. I hear some things that I'm really interested in in here, but also a few things that I'm not too keen on. I think a Van Helsing franchise sounds like a lot of fun. Me too. Because Van Helsing first appeared in Bram Stoker's Dracula. He's uh, the, the hero of that book, actually. And then it gives you so much ability to have him go up against different creatures and monsters with every film. So I think there's a lot of potential to a Van Helsing film franchise. I just feel like Universal doesn't know what they want to do with their d- monsters right now. I mean, we had two Dracula movies come out this spring. Yeah, I mean. So it was April, and I think, okay, maybe not spring, but the end of May, early June, with Last Voyage of the Demeter. Renfield was in April. And it seemed like they just went, let's do opposite ends of the spectrum. We'll do a silly, goofy action superhero movie with Renfield, and then we'll do a dark horror movie with The Last Voyage of the Demeter. And unfortunately for Universal, neither, neither of them hit. They were both bombs. Renfield is my least favorite movie of 2023. I Same. thought I thought they didn't really put any effort into it. Obviously, it's well cast. I mean, Nicholas Holt, I think, is a really great actor. And then Nick Cage's Dracula, he's fun as Dracula. You had a great running review of it. I did. One I, of my, I was dying. My running review is James, pretty terrific. James loves movies. But it, it, I'll just recap my review of it because production-wise, it makes no sense. Aesthetically, there's just green light everywhere. They're trying to go so stylized with it. But, like, we're in this health group, this health, mental health group, Talking in a gymnasium. In a gy- there's a green light everywhere. Where's the green light coming from? Why is there green light? Why- it's just green and red, green and red, green and red. It thinks it's the Nic- Nicholas Winning Reffin movie so hard, <laughs> and or thinks it's- thinks it's John Wick. And then, I mean, Nick Cage is fun, but it seemed like a waste of time. And Nicholas Holt, he's a great actor, but Renfield was just a terrible character. He was so unconfident and really unattractive in terms of like wanting to watch this character in an entire film he's just the simp for aquafina's character he was but like how do you not make like just a, a sexy suave <laughs> cool sophisticated renfield just like luring people in with his charisma and his charm and just being a fucking badass but no instead he's just like a scared little guy who eats bugs and he gets superpowers who wants to watch that for two hours well i will say i mean renfield isn't really suave or sexy we well, don't have no yeah but he's not this either okay yeah no yeah i know you're right but it's not like he's james bond but if i <laughs> but why not make it like that like why not no, you, i think it's a good idea it's to make to make renfield like a perfect um person to court 
and bring Dracula his victims. Exactly. And you would have to be very charming to do that. Exactly. And I just thought the plot was pretty terrible because then they're getting mixed in with mobsters that run the city. It they became own, an NCIS episode. They own the entire police department. The Aquafine or her sister storyline was like NYPD Blue. It was just not well written and not well shot. And I just really did not like this movie. And I, I hate to say that because I love movies, but I was really let down by this one. And it was not a very enjoyable experience. It's also my least favorite film of 2023. It was just a big disappointment because I love the novel. And I mean... The thing with the bugs in Renfield is uh, he becomes obsessed with blood because Dracula is his master and Dracula promised Renfield I'll turn you after you give me enough service. He never does. It's all just a manipulation. But Renfield believes that by eating bugs, he's uh, ab absorbing their life force through their blood. It's just, he's just like a madman in a mental institution. That's that's who he, his character is. I just This movie did not do it for me. And, it's, and again... He's got the ugliest apartment I've ever seen in my <laughs> life. When he leaves Renfield, I mean, when he leaves Dracula, he gets his own apartment. The ugliest apartment I've ever seen. How like, do you get the apartment anyways? I don't, he's, probably, he's got no job history. He probably has some cash somewhere. Yeah, he probably maybe. sold some jewels. But, like, <laughs> he just ate a box of crayons and puked it all over the walls. It was just, like, the ugliest pastel. Every color in the universe was in his apartment. It's just... Ugly, like the sweater he wears in that movie. There's no way Nicholas Holt didn't put that sweater on and was like, "Oh, my okay, God. I guess this is it. I guess I gotta wear this guess, sweater today." I guess this is what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty bad. But what's really impressive about the Universal Monster movies is how old they are, but they still have just aged so well. Unlike Renfield. <laughs> but this isn't a rip on Renfield episode, so let's head as to much our as you want it to be. So let's head to our intermission, and then we'll get back to more of Universal's monsters, classics, moderns, and upcoming films but before we continue the best way to support raiders of the lost podcast is to share us with your friends and family members sharing a podcast is the very best way to help a podcast grow word of mouth is the best so please share us with everybody you know who loves horror movies who loves movies and tv send them raiders of the lost podcast you can also leave those five star ratings and reviews on spotify and have in apple not happle they help us get seen by new people, and we're going to read one of the written reviews on Apple in just a minute. We'd love to read those out. And also, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. It is a subscription-based form of support for the show. Every patron has access to two weekly bonus episodes every single week, as well as a ton of other perks. We have subscriptions at $2, $5, $10, $25, and $100. Every tier gets better and better perks as you go up the ladder, obviously. $10, that gets you access to our Discord. We have watch parties on there. It's a great film community that we've built. $25, you get a custom episode. Whatever you want us to do, we'll do an episode on it for you, as well as the $100, there's so many goddamn perks. We have merch you get for free. You get to come on the show for a fun guest segment after three months. Private watch party. All kinds of things. Thank you so much for everyone who is a patron. You can sign up today at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast to get access to over 200 bonus episodes every week. And you can also listen on Spotify now. You can connect them and have your own private playlist on Spotify for Patreon with our show. Thank you all so much. There's also a link in the description. We like the links. This episode, of course, is sponsored by our friends at MoviePosters.com, the number one place to get your posters online today. Be sure to use our promo code Raiders10 at MoviePosters.com. They get 10% off your order right now. They have a huge selection, pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable in their poster library, as well as all sorts of fr framing, sizes, and backlighting for your poster needs. They make a great gift for the film lover in your life, as well as an amazing way to deck out your place and show your passion and love for cinema with movie posters. They also just uploaded our film, Midnight Ruin. You can get some Midnight Ruin posters on movieposters.com if you'd like to. Great prices. We have these posters all over our home, all over our set. High quality, very affordable prices. This is the best place for all your poster needs. Now be sure to use our promo code Raiders10 at movieposters.com to get 10% off your order right now. Now, are you ready for our intermission, Anthony? I'm ready. All right, we're going to begin with the movie quote competition. All right, here we go. This is two characters speaking. The first one says, Amanda, in your own time, tell me the first thing you remember. I woke up. All I could taste was blood and metal. And then I saw the body. There was a knife.
Amanda. I don't Amanda, know. Amanda, 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 Amanda show. Saw. Oh, nice. So that's the girl who survives in Saw. In there, and then she's being asked. Which questions. trap did she survive from? The giant metal the, thing that's the classed. bear trap. So it's, it's the, yeah, the, yeah, reverse, the reverse bear, bear trap. trap. Man. Think of it as a bear trap, except reverse. <laughs> <laughs> that's a pretty good, pretty good jigsaw Amanda, voice. I want to play a little game. A game. I want to play a game. <laughs> you're probably wondering why you're here. You ever see the Jigsaw Roommate video? <laughs> yeah, I have. It's so good. This is one of the best videos ever on YouTube. <laughs> this is just like having Jigsaw as a roommate, and he's a roommate. It's just like a normal guy, and Jigsaw keeps like making these crazy traps to like hide his car keys, and <laughs> like he puts his like cat like in danger. Your mittens mittens will die if you, you have you have thirty seconds to save Mitten's life. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't, <laughs> he's like late for work and he put his car keys in like some crazy contraption. Your car keys in the side of the blender. You have to get them out by sticking your hand in there while it's on. <laughs> Something like that. It's, it's so funny. Oh my god, it's great. I love it's YouTube. Genius. I love YouTube. All right, here's my quote. I love you. I've always loved you. I can give you a hint if if you need. It. It's a tough one. I love you. I've always loved you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it sounds familiar, but it's, it's not super specific. I'm, you know. Okay, here's a, here's a hint. It's done with sign language. And that should be a, an easy hint after that. Well, hmm, I'm trying to think. It's not Coda. Oh, man, I'm probably going to be upset when I don't get this. Most likely. <laughs> Most likely. What is it? A Quiet Place. Oh, sacrifice himself. God damn it. Oh, man, I don't want to cry right now, man. You're going to have to. Man, Krasinski knows what he's doing. I can't wait for his new movie, if. Himself in his own movie. All right. Wow, I just got emotional for a second thinking of that scene. All right. Guess this movie release. Guess this movie release here. Freddy and Jason. Freddy versus Jason. Freddy versus, like, what is this, like a childhood romance? <laughs> Freddy, Freddy and Jason. <laughs> Freddy versus Jason, 2006? 2003. Damn. Damn, that's old. Damn. Damn. <laughs> I remember watching, we watched that, we were like, fucking, yes! <laughs> we, were, we were excited for that. <laughs> it's so silly. All right, what year did The Holiday come out? 2003. <laughs> I'm really confident. We there. reversed there. Yeah, it wasn't. Oh my like, god, twitter. I did act like I knew it. All right, movie pop quiz time. What country is Robert England from? Robert England plays Freddy Krueger. Um, he's from England. He's from America. Damn. <laughs> he's from Glendale, California. Fucking a. <laughs> what a trick question, man. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because when you ask that, it's actually a bullshit question. Because you, when you ask that, you make you imply that he's not from America. That's a bullshit. Why? Why did I? How did I? Bullshit it? question. Listen, the way you spell England in his last name, there's no A in it. Bullshit question. <laughs> Got him. Got him. So that's a that's a trick question. It is a trick question. It's exactly what well, it is. What country is he from? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if he's from America. Is that an impression of me or Goofy? Uh, my name's James. <laughs> it's pretty terrible. I don't know, it sounds just like you. What two movies did John Krasinski direct before A Quiet Place? What's that movie with, um, that suburb movie? The suburb? <laughs> it's like there's a house. <laughs> it's the, the someone with a B. The someone with an S. <laughs> Cement. <laughs> I can't remember what it's called. It's the last name of the family, if that if that helps. The Johnsons. The jo <laughs> what is it? Oh, I'm just I'm looking it up because I forgot to write it down. Oh, you forgot to write it down. He doesn't even the Hollers. Know. The Hollers. That's the what Hollers. I was so close. Yeah, Anna Kendrick plays his wife. Yeah, the Hollers. It's a suburb movie, as James said. <laughs> it takes place in the suburbs. <laughs> He's got a beard. Oh, that summer movie? He's got a beard. <laughs> Jay, is another he doesn't one. have a beard. He's clean shaven. Oh, I'm thinking of the one that he's, that Maggie Gyllenhaal's in. That's the way we go. He didn't direct that. I never said he did. Well, why were you thinking of it then? What's the other movie? I don't know. It's called 
<laughs> You're looking that up again too. <laughs> to you don't even know the movies. No, I know. I, I know of it. He <laughs> asks the question. He doesn't even know the answers to. Brief interviews with hideous men. It's yeah, pretty good. Never seen it. It's pretty good. I I watched it when it came out. He, um, it's like a mockumentary of interviewing men about dating and stuff. It's pretty funny. It's okay. Moving on. It's <laughs> pretty funny. Okay. Moving on. <laughs> pretty good. Seen better. <laughs> <laughs> not how I would have done it. <laughs> He's not like a TikTok commenter. No, but then he fucking blew the chains off the door with the quiet place. <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> I saw one of our comments on our Killers of Flower Moon clip was four hour waste of time. I'm like, Jesus Christ. Whoa. Yeah. It's not even four hours. Not even four hours. Yeah, three and a half. You're going to watch TikToks for three hours. Like, what's the difference? All right. I got some unsubscribes here. So our first unsubscribe is from, I'm sorry, I screenshotted it and cut out his name. God damn. How could you do that? I didn't do that. <laughs> Just make the record be known that Anthony did that. Shit. Not me. Hold on, I got it. I can pull it up. It's on Letterboxd. I got it. People are waiting for this, Anthony. They're waiting. They're dying. All right, hold on. I got it right here. I got it right here. I got it here. Okay, Alex. Alex, on our, he wrote a Midnight Ruin review. It's uh, He wrote a ton of great stuff. And they wrote, uh, very excited for the future of their films and can't wait to watch the next one. Unsubscribed! Thanks, Alex. Then we got a huge-ass comment on YouTube. Again, I cut out the person. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> What's up with you cutting out names? Well, this one, the comment is like two paragraphs. So, like, his name didn't even fit in it. That's so, a long comment. So, yeah. Unfortunately, it was it was about um, McCready in the thing. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, whoever I cut out, uh, they wrote an unsubscribe. Sorry, bud. Then we got uh, the white wolf on your Dooney's meme photo. I posted a floating head image of the Dune poster, except the Goonies image. The Goonies characters' heads were superimposed. Really on. funny. Really funny. And I said, yeah. why do people hate on floating head posters? <laughs> then uh, the white wolf, 77, wrote, this is just Lynch's Dune in the good timeline. Unsubscribe. It's <laughs> good. And then uh, um, we got Jazzy Jeff wrote on our Boston slang clip. Educational content? Unsubscribed. <laughs> the funny thing about Boston videos is we got so much hate oh from Bostonians. Oh, my God. Imagine if you hashtag, like, Boston or Massachusetts, too. Holy. I tagged Boston. Um, Geotagged it in one of them. Oh, okay. People gotcha. were, like, shitting on our accents, and I had to be like, we don't live in Boston. And some guy, he wrote, this sounds like some bullshit east of Worcester. Nobody talks like that west of Worcester. I'm like, I was like, yeah, this is about Boston, <laughs> not Worcester. <laughs> yeah, that's why I stopped doing that content. In addition to not making money off it, but like, so angry. It's good, dude. That was my. I used to get like 20 of those like an hour. People who shat in our accents so many times. Was, and I was like, okay, well, how about you show me Matt Damon's accent? How is his accent? He's like the most famous Bostonian. It's like how Star Wars fans hate Star Wars. Bostonians hate Bostonians. <laughs> they really do. <laughs> uh, Bostonians online, yeah. I was shocked. Man. Not all of them, but a lot of Bostonians cannot take I was like, a joke. We made a fun TikTok video about Boston slang, and like they just had to hate it. You can't just be like, hey, this is so fun. I, I, say, these, I say these words all the time. Oh, yeah, I say, the, I, say the same, I say wicked all the time. Oh, this is the worst Boston accent I've ever heard. You guys aren't real assholes. Very critical. Unreal. I love Boston to death, but it can be a critical place. <laughs> it's only for the strong. <laughs> Next up, Barney Davis wrote in our Shawshank episode, can't empathize with a wife killer. What about Cliff Booth? Unsubscribed. <laughs> Killed his fucking wife. You don't believe that, do you? <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, my favorite comment of the week was from Shins of the Father on our The Town clip talking about uh, the locals that were cast. And Shins of the Father wrote, Man, things changed for the worst after Will left. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was really good. It was really clever. All right, we have a great five star review from Zra Heiser. Zra Heiser. New, new obsession. Oh, is that Zachary? Maybe. I have no idea. Zra Heiser. Zra Heiser. Love these guys and their take on movies and TV shows. This podcast has made me a massive film buff where in the past I'd only watch superhero movies and rarely go to the theater. Now I've expanded my taste and I've and I go weekly to the theater and got readers to think. That's awesome. They've created a movie community that I'm glad to be a part of every single day. Zerahiser, thank you so much. Thanks, We're pal. so glad that you've expanded your film taste. You know, it's like it's like a, a food, like a, a taste palette. The more you ingest 
film wise, the more you come to love and enjoy yeah. and the more you can accept it. I mean, you're more interested in international features or just movies outside of the realm of what you're comfortable in. And, you know, it's all about expanding your palette. That's a good point because I was actually talking to a fan yesterday or the other day about uh, Bergman and Tarkovsky. Yeah, and you can't just ask someone who's just like big into Star Wars and MCU to like watch a Bergman movie. Like, yeah. they're not going to be able to sit through it. So they tried watching a Bergman movie and then they couldn't, they turned it off halfway through. And I was like, you know, it's just, oh, it's in eight and a half. He, he, he tried watching eight and a half and he turned it off halfway through because he wasn't really getting it. And I was like, you know what? It's cool. It's great that you're interested in those movies, but you're not going to, it's like, and I was it's drastic. Tra- yeah, it's a big change and a big shift in the kind of film. But I was like, don't give up. Just uh, be open to them. You don't have to force yourself to watch them, but, you know, tr- just try to watch them every once in a while. And it's a different kind of a movie. I, I compared it to, you know, it's like an abstract painting. You know, it's like a Picasso painting compared to a Da Vinci painting. They're very different kinds of painting. Techniques. It's like listening to Fall Out Boy and then, like, mo- listening to Mozart. If, like, if, like yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> if, like, all you listen to is, like, it's like, it's like Trav- if you listen to Travis Scott and then you listen to Mozart, you'd be like, what the fuck is this? I, I guess. No, no, you won't be able to digest it very well. Exactly, yeah. So the thing I was, I was talking to them about is, like, you know, don't give up and just, like, you got to kind of train your brain in a way you got to – Get your brain under to, used to these kinds of movies until the point where when you're used to them and you like them, then you can really enjoy them. Yeah, if you eat chicken nuggies and mac and cheese every day yeah. and then you go get, like, sushi, you might not like it. You might not like it. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> I'm not saying that Star Wars is chicken nuggies and mac and cheese. James said that. <laughs> I love chi- I eat chicken nuggets every day, bro. Chicken tendies every day. James said it. I eat a lot of fried chicken. <laughs> <laughs> I think Star Wars is prime rib. Star Wars is great, but I'm just, we just say that to expand your palette. No, no, yeah, I'm just kidding, yeah. Everybody knows that, like, a Tarkovsky tastes... movie. A Tarkovsky movie is very different from a Star Wars movie. Yeah, it takes a while to be able to, like, get into those, you know? You, you gotta ease your way into it. Start off with something like... And it's, like, it's always, it's gonna be frustrating at first. Just, it like, is. honestly, like, go through, like, a, like, Lost in Translation is, like, a good transition, something slower. And... Well, I told him, because he wants to get into abstract films, I told him to start with uh, Blue Velvet, David Lynch's film. Yeah, but even before that, that's still, you know, getting pretty far in there. No, but, so it's very engaging and crazy and entertaining, though. So True. That's, that's a film that's like, holy shit, what is happening? Yeah, like, I this mean, is crazy. got a great villain, so. Yeah, so yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. Harper's awesome in that movie. Yeah, so it's like a good appetizer of getting into that kind of storytelling, because it's so fucking bonkers. So you're like, holy shit, this is amazing. Very entertaining. All right. Well, what do we got next? Stream Streaming recommendations. recommendations. I have Child's Play. Oh, shit. Which is on Max. This movie came out in 1988, and it's wow. an all-timer, man, when it comes to slashers. and 88? Yeah, man. It's an old one. I, always, I really like the um, the one where they go to the military school. Yeah, that's a good one. And he puts bullets in the, in the guns. That's oh a good God. one. I can't remember what I was doing. I think I was making a clip, and I was pulling up clips from Child's Play for it something and i was on the scene where chucky comes to life in front of the mom because the mom thinks she's going insane because like halfway through the movie yeah, yeah. her son keeps saying like chucky talks and like is doing like things are happening around the house and she's getting freaked out and she grabs him and lifts him in the air talk to me damn it talk to me you god damn it like you're gonna say something say something and chucky's just still a doll and not moving at all and and and, and inanimate and then she lights the fire and she's like, talk to me. I'm going to throw you in the fire. And he's like, you goddamn bitch. Comes to life, just calls her a bitch and starts punching her in the face. <laughs> you fucking bitch. That's so funny. It's the craziest shit, man. And, and the, that, the factory ending is scary. Yeah. That, oh, that freaked me out, that factory conclusion. It's like, a crazy kind of, kind of like scene. like Terminator ending. It's a crazy scene. Yeah. It's, it's and terrifying. And melting him. I watched it three times. I can't believe we watched that shit when we were kids. But that scene is so, I watched it three times in a row on YouTube just to like, I was like, this fucking movie was crazy. There's this doll just <laughs> coming to life and killing this lady. But it's a good one. It's a good reveal. Very, very scary movie for kids. We should uh, not have watched it at our not. age. My recommendation for today is, is keeping in tone with the uh, episode, the original The Invisible Man from 1933 is on Amazon Prime. It's only 90 minutes. I highly recommend checking it out. It's super fun. It's amazing. It's incredible. The visual effects and special effects are mind-blowing and still hold up and look good today. Absolutely check it out. One of the best laughs in cinema history, yeah. too. Yeah. Really great laugh. Well, that's the cool thing about these monster movies, segueing back into Universal's monster movies, is 
They're not very long, these older ones. They're usually like an hour 20, hour 30. Fighter Frankenstein like, is 70 minutes. Yeah, they're pretty short. They're they're fast, and I think they're really exciting and fun for the, for the most part. It's a lot of Friday. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they are. I like, um, do you like Frankenstein or Briar Frankenstein more? Briar Frankenstein's better. Uh, it's just a tighter story. It's got better scares, and um, uh, it's more tragic because the, the monster is beginning to think and speak and uh, become more human. But what's crazy about Frankenstein, the end of it, the end of the film, we're spoiling these movies, sorry, but they've been out for 90 years, where he takes, he drags Henry Frankenstein up into the top of that t- that windmill tower, and he throws him off the roof, and Henry lands on one of the windmills that's spinning. <laughs> it's a great shot because it's clearly a dummy, but it's just flailing oh, in the yeah, air. Oh, yeah, yeah. It slams like, it drops like 30 feet and yeah. slams on one of those windmills. Somehow he survives. Survives <laughs> it! It's like, oh, the windmill broke his fault. It didn't break his back? <laughs> and then there's, in the sequel, he has no damage on his face. He's not even dirty. He's a little sickly in the sequel. But like at the end of the movie, he's like recovered at a wedding. It's like, dude, how is this guy alive? How is he standing? No, no, no. And the, they think he's dead at the end. Well, okay, sorry. It, it's revealed that he's alive in the in Bride. My bad, my bad. No worries, man. It's okay. That's what I'm here for. Yeah, right. He's in the back of the truck. I think he's dead. That's, that's right. That's yeah. what I'm here for. Yeah. No worries. Still <laughs> like, how the fuck do you survive that? Exactly. <laughs> but uh, Frankenstein in Bride Frankenstein throws a couple of dummies around. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's pretty great. funny. It's pretty great. Like he throws an old lady down the the tunnel into the the cavern, and she it's just clearly a dummy, but it's so funny. Uh, but Bride Frankenstein's better because it's just what are better paced, better sets. Uh, all around a better story, and there's really no questionable things about it at all. There's a couple of questions in the in Frankenstein, like why would Henry want to like Henry after he gives up on his project with the creature with the monster, he's like I want to marry you, and it's like their wedding is literally happening that same day. It's like I mean, what are the I mean, come on, can't push it back. And also, they don't nobody checks to make sure that the missing man wasn't killed by the monster up yeah. in the tower. Like, and then no, one of the women gets killed by yeah. a Frankenstein. Everyone's too. like, what I mean, about the creature. what about Mister Blah Blah Blah? Everybody's like, oh, he's just late. He'll be here. <laughs> <laughs> he's just been strangled by the monster. So there's, there's that in the third act. The screenplay is just like a little like it's too big of a plot hole. I think. Yeah. But the like, why of, would you have a wedding the in same, the same day. in the same building in yeah. the same home? Well, not in the same home. Well, it's downstairs. Well, Frank's not. Oh, yeah. It's in town. He comes, but he's in the yeah, yeah. in the basement. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Man. He's in the basement. <laughs> but it's just, but Brian Frankenstein, it's perfect. There's really nothing at all wrong with it whatsoever. And then it has the most tragic ending where the bride rejects him out of fear. And then he blows up the, build, the, the building. And it's just, it's tragic because he was desperate for another monster like him. Someone like him who could understand him because everybody's afraid of him. And except then, for the blind man. Except for the blind man. Good. Drink. Good. And then the bride is born. And then when she takes a look at Frank at Frankenstein's monster. She's like, I could do better. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. How much do you make? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, honey. Are you making six figures? Honey, you might be six four, but you ain't my type. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but no, she screams in fear and terror, and it it, tra- it breaks his heart, and then he kills them all. So it's a very tragic ending. It's a very, very powerful ending. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, so James Whale, he was one of the most important filmmakers for Universal at the time. He made Frankenstein in 1931, The Invisible Man in 1933, and then The Bride of Frankenstein in 1935. And so he, I think, was really integral to this all working. He's one of these great old filmmakers that just no one talks about anymore outside of just the horror genre and outside of classic horror but he was a huge influence on cinema back then and then from where it's come to now like the influence of james wells as well as other filmmakers in the universal horror genre but james will i mean he made the big ones frankenstein and the invisible man the bride of frankenstein those are probably the three most popular outside of dracula as well the three three of the best too and also millicent patrick was uh instrumental to the design of many of the creatures so millicent patrick was a makeup artist and special effects artist she was actually fascinating story and a very tragic story she was a disney animator very talented artist and she actually did some of the sequences in fantasia the ghost sequences and the mountain sequence and she actually created that big like demon monster the huge one there was she did all that Um, but she wasn't allowed to be credited as an animator because disney didn't have any female editors and so she did a ton of work for Disney, was never credited. And so she left Disney 
and got into special effects at Universal. And so Bud Westmore was the special effects, head of special effects for Universal, and he was the head of that department for like 15, 20 years doing all of the Universal Monster movies. However, and he came from a family of makeup artists and hairstylists, so his dad started like the first ever uh, hairstylist company department ever in the 10s, 1910s and 1900s. And so Bud Westmore was the head of the department, but he basically had a team that did all the work for him. And Millicent Patrick was one of those members and she was not allowed to be credited for anything. So she actually designed the Creature from the Black Lagoon. She designed Frankenstein. And then she also designed uh, Mr. Hyde from Dr. Jekyll. Mr. Hyde received no credit for any of them. But what, And what happened with Creature from the Black Lagoon was so she came it's the most one of the most iconic monsters ever yeah. she did the design um helped craft it and then to promote the film the uh, universal center on a cross-country tour to promote the monster and being the des designer of the creature and then newspapers all over wherever she was traveling would run stories about her and it was it was like this press tour for it and bud westmore got super jealous and so when she got back from her tour he fired her and then blacklisted her. So she was never able to work as a makeup artist or a special effects artist ever again in the film industry because he blacklisted her. And he was from a very powerful family. Like I said, his dad basically created the idea of a makeup department and a hair department. Like he used the guy who started those things. And so Millicent Patrick, even though she created some of the most famous designs in the history of Universal's monsters, she was outed and she was never credited for anything. Um, but there's a book was written about her 10 years ago with all this information. And then even Guillermo del Toro made a couple of tweets talking about it, saying that um, she was her, her career. It, it, she came up with the most incredible designs ever. And she's one of the most brilliant artists ever in special effects and makeup history. And she deserved to have the credit. So it's, it's a tragic tale of, you know, a woman who was in an industry that didn't want her, even though she was supremely talented. That's so sad. I remember you told me about that like a couple of years ago. Yeah. And it reminded me of that Tim Burton movie where... Big Eyes. Yeah, Big Eyes. The uh, the painter gets the credit stolen from her husband, right? Basically takes credit for everything. It's, it's terrible. It's a terrible tragedy. Because these are some of the greatest horror movies of all time. Yeah. And the aesthetic and the characters have lived on forever. I mean, Frankenstein. Creature, Frankenstein's monster yes. has lived on forever. And so James Will, it's really interesting... So he was an openly gay filmmaker oh, and director wow. at the time in the 1930s and 20s, obviously. And so The Bride of Frankenstein, it's believed and you can look at as him basically flipping procreation on its head where we have, like I said earlier, two males, two men creates life with a creature. <laughs> and then point. they create two creatures that can't procreate with the creature and then The Bride of Frankenstein. They, create, they want to create a bride for Frankenstein. But obviously, there's rejection, so they don't procreate. So there's so like the, the heterosexual, non heterosexual stuff doesn't work. Exactly. So yeah. the heterosexual couple does not procreate, but the you could say the the non heterosexual couple, the homosexual not homosexual, but the non heterosexual, the two men yeah. create life. It's Fra Frankenstein, Doctor Proteus. Yeah, that's a great point. I like that. So that's a lot of people. That's like, fun. You can look at the film like that. Yeah, it's pretty great. <laughs> that's really fascinating. <laughs> now I made uh we made a top ten list of our favorite Universal monster movies. I think it'd be fun to go through them. The top 10 monster movies. I think it'd be Laugh Riot. <laughs> Laugh Riot. Let's do it. All right. At number 10, we have The Black Cat, which came out in 1934. Uh, it's not really considered a monster movie, but everything in this era is considered a universal monster movie. So this is actually an adaptation of the famous Edgar Allan Poe story, The Poem. So this film came out in 1934, has a critic score on Rotten Tomatoes of 88%, an audience score of 69%, and an IMDb of 6.9%. Honeymooning in Hungary, Joan and Peter Allison share their train compartment with Dr. Vitus Verdegast, a courtly but tragic man who is returning to the remains of the town he defended before becoming a prisoner of war for 15 years. When their hotel-bound bus crashes in a mountain storm and Joan is injured, the travelers seek refuge in the home, built fortress-like upon the site of a bloody battlefield of famed architect Halmer Poltzig. There, a cat-phobic Verdegast learns that his wife's fate Grieves for his lost daughter and must play a game of chess for Allison's life. This is a really great kind of noirish horror film. Again, the chess game is really the hinge of the story. Really fantastic cinematography, production design, excellent acting, all around very solid movie. 
Next up, we have The Creature from the Black Lagoon coming out all the way in 1954. Rotten Tomatoes, it's an 80% critic, 74% audience. And IMDb, it's a 6.9. It's a pretty good movie. And I, I think the, the greatest strength is The Creature. Yeah, I mean, if you the saw story's this in 19, not. Yeah, yeah, if you saw this in 1954, it would have been awesome. But it kind of reminds me of Anaconda, to be honest. Yeah, the, the story's story not lies. super strong. Yeah, so they find this fossil. These people find this fossil hand in the middle of like a cliffside. And then in the like, Amazon we, have to, we have to find out where this came from. We have to find more of it. And they just rip it off of the, like, horribly. <laughs> like, I don't know what kind of stone that is. What kind, no, what kind of archaeologist just rips it out of, this, out of the wall? Like, you got to be careful, guys. <laughs> and then, you know, we get the, the hint of the swamp. I mean, the, the creature's black hand that sees, like, still alive. And then eventually they go on an adventure trying to find more evidence of this creature. And then the creature from the Black Lagoon eventually starts to come onto the ship, and he falls in love with the lady that's on their trip as well. He try, tries to steal her a couple times. Her name's Kay. Kay. He tries to steal Kay a couple times. Kay's not having it. Kay's not into it, but she's into one of the other guys, one of the other schoolers. She's guys. not into the Gilman? <laughs> <laughs> she's not into the Black the Gil, the Gilman, no. She's into Steve, whatever his name is. <laughs> the guy with the good tan. That's who he's into. Oh, you like into. him? I you can like tell it's tin? black and white. It's a joke, Anthony. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> but also there's scuba gears, like short shorts and then tanks. <laughs> Oxygen tanks and short shorts. <laughs> that being said, the underwater sequences are really cool. Yeah, they're pretty really great, great for the time. Yeah, really great they for really the time. They really are. Yeah. <laughs> the, the harpoon shooting is <laughs> yeah. cool. But there's a good amount of shot under yeah. underwater photography. It's really just a story that hold, that holds it down. Yeah, and the design of the creature is great. It's, uh, it's one of the most iconic monsters, I think, in my opinion, of all time. The design of that creature. It's fucked up in the end, though. <laughs> <laughs> He's back for the sequels, though. There's a, there were a bunch of creature movies. Next up, at number eight, we have The Hunchback of Notre Dame, which came out in 1923. This is a 93% on Rotten Tomatoes for critics, 76% audience, 7.2 on IMDb. We all know the story of Hunchback of Notre Dame. It very much follows the same idea as the Disney adaptation. This is a black and white silent film. With incredible performances, especially the physical performance, it's actually the same actor who played the Phantom of the Opera in the Phantom in the Phantom of the Opera. He, Lon Chaney, actually said that the Phantom makeup was way worse than the Hunchback makeup. Um, but it's great, excellent story. Uh, the prosthetics, special effects are amazing. But like I said earlier, the filmmaking is really big in scale, huge sets, large numbers of extras, just like kind of like reminiscent of Cleopatra, like those huge epics. Is really impressive and also capturing the incredible architecture of that city is just really fantastic. And then we have The Wolf Band coming out in 1941, starring Lon Chaney Jr., who followed in his father's footsteps in the Monsterverse. He also played the son, he was in the son of Frankenstein as well. Now, The Wolf Man follows obviously a man who gets attacked by a wolf or a creature, not realizing that it was a werewolf. He had a cane that was made of silver and he killed it with it, but he also got bit, starts to turn into a werewolf, and he's warned by the other werewolf's gypsy mother that, like, yo, bro, you are about to be a monster. He also is uh, voyeuristic as fuck because yeah. he spies <laughs> on the woman he ends up courting with the telescope, and then he goes to her, uh, her place of residence and, like, flirts with her. You know, he runs into her at a store. He's like, uh, he mentioned something about her bedroom. She's like, how do you know what I have in my bedroom? <laughs> He's like, I'm psychic. <laughs> He's like, I know you have like a necklace up there. It's very sleazy. Crazy. It's a great performance though. And it has a great transformation. Uh, again, we talked about it earlier, the slow dissolves of different yeah. frames of transforming your feet and uh, different parts of the werewolf body. But it's not a super scary movie, but visually it's stunning. Some of the best photography you'll see in a horror movie yeah you get the smoky landscapes and and woods and it's also very tragic because at the end he as the wolf man he's killed but then he transforms back to his human form and everybody chalks up to be him being killed by the wolf so tragic that he dies and nobody knows it um, but fortunately nobody knows that he turned into a monster which is nice next up at number six we have the phantom of the opera which came out in 1923 this is the movie that started it all, really, for the Universal Monster movies. This has a 90% on critic score on Rotten Tomatoes, an 84% audience score, and a 7.5 on IMDb. At the Opera of Paris, a mysterious phantom threatens a famous lyric singer, Carlotta, and forces her to give up her role for unknown Christian Day. Christian Christine meets his, this phantom, a masked man in the catacombs where he lives. What's his goal? What's his secret? This film starring Lon Chaney in the title role of the deformed phantom who haunts the Paris Opera House, causing murder and mayhem 
in an attempt to make the woman he loves a star. So this film was actually so successful that it really convinced Universal to approach monster movies and horror movies in a big way. It was a massive hit. Excellent film, great story, great acting, tragic, but also excellent death and murder. Um, it's a lot of fun. And again, the makeup, I think it's the most terrifying makeup in the monster reverse because he's a human, but he's so deformed and scary looking. It's like almost, it, it's very monstrous in a way because he is human, but inhuman at the same time. Um, and I think it's just brilliant prosthetics. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's pretty very creepy. scary. It's pretty With creepy. The teeth, yeah, it's messed up. Number five, we have Frankenstein, released in 1931. Rotten Tomatoes, 94% critic, 87% audience. IMDb, it's a 7.8. It's about this guy. He's this crazy scientist named Henry. Goes by Hank for short. Henry Frankenstein. I don't know if he goes by Hank. But he has this crazy idea of getting a bunch of cadaver bodies together and cutting them up and putting them together to create a life form that's huge. He could play for the Lakers, probably. <laughs> and then he puts him on a, a medical bed. Puts him up through the roof and gets him struck by lightning and reanimates this corpse that he's put together. Alive! And he calls himself, I know what it's like to be a god. I've created life. And then basically the film is him trying to keep this monster around without him wreaking havoc. However, he wreaks havoc all over the, all over the Bavarian town they live in. The other scientists and doctors say you have to kill him. They try to, take, they try to kill him a few times, but he's just, since he's met with so much aggression and... For that, he shows aggression, and he attacks anyone who tries to stop him or try to attack him. Kills a bunch of people, kills some innocent people. Kills a little girl by um, accident. It's really sad. It's a tough scene. And then he dies. Um, the the townsfolk chase him to that what you, windmill tower. What what is it? Just a windmill. Windmill tower. Yeah, windmill tower <laughs> with picks pickaxes and and torches, and then the uh, building gets caught on fire, and then. Henry tries to stop him at the ceiling, but then on the roof, and then Frank, then the monster throws Frankenstein off the roof, and again, <laughs> drops him 40 feet. If you've never seen the movie, at least look this clip up on YouTube. It's fucking hilarious. <laughs> Somehow he survives for the sequel, but... It's just a dummy that just like... <laughs> and also, we think that the monster dies as well. Until the sequel. But first, we must get into number four, The Mummy, which came out in 1932. It has a Rotten Tomatoes critic score of 89%, an audience of 72%, with a pretty low 7.0 on IMDb, I think this movie's much better than that, and it's that's why we have a number of four. Set in 1921, a field expedition in Egypt discovers the mummy of ancient Egyptian prince Imhotep. 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 <laughs> who was condemned and buried alive for sacrilege. Also found in the tomb is the Scroll of Thoth, which can bring the dead back to life. One night, a young member of the expedition reads the scroll out loud like a dummy and goes insane, realizing that he has brought Imhotep back to life. Ten years later, disguised as a modern Egyptian, the mummy attempts to reunite with his lost love, an ancient princess who has been reincarnated into a beautiful young woman. Great film. Excellent, excellent special effects and really great ending. Number three, we have Dracula, 1931, 94% Rotten Tomatoes critic score, audience 82%, IMDb, a 7.4. After a harrowing ride through the Carpathian Mountains in Eastern Europe, Renfield enters a Castle Dracula, enters Castle Dracula to finalize the transfer of Carfax Abbey in London to Count Dracula, who is actually a vampire. Renfield is drugged by the eerily hypnotic Count and turned into one of his thralls, protecting him during his sea voyage to London. After sucking the blood and turning the young Lucy Weston into a vampire, Dracula turns his attention to, to her friend Mina Seward, daughter of Dr. Seward, who then calls in a specialist, Dr. Van Helsing, to diagnose the <laughs> sudden deterioration of Mina's health. Van Helsing, realizing that Dracula is indeed a vampire, tries to prepare Mina's fiance. John Harker and Dr. Stewart for what is to come and the measures that will have to be taken to prevent Mina from becoming one of the undead. I love this movie. The cinematography is amazing and it's a legendary performance. Really, really incredible stuff. At number two, we're in the heavy hitters now. Top two Universal Monster movies. We have The Bride of Frankenstein, which came out in 1935. Rotten Tomatoes critic score, 98%. Highest so far. And an audience score of 
IMDb, 7.8. Dr. Frankenstein and his monster both turn out to be alive. They both survived that burning windmill, not killed as previous, previously believed. Dr. Frankenstein wants to get out of the evil experiment business, but when a mad scientist and his former teacher and master, Dr. Pretorius, kidnaps his wife, Dr. Frankenstein agrees to help him create a new creature, a woman, to be the companion of the monster. This synopsis I got from IMDb is incorrect, actually. Pretorius does not kidnap his wife. Frank, the, the monster kidnaps Frankenstein's wife to get him to do it. So Pretorius, so pre, what's actually really great visual effects, Pretorius was his master, and then Pretorius reveals, after learning the news about the monster that Frankenstein created, he's like, I've done the same shit, dude. However, he's created little miniature people through growth of, like, he didn't just, like, reanimate dead bodies. He grew people. However, the problem was they stayed, like, six yeah, inches tall. Yeah, like, those glass jars. Yeah, in the glass. In, in the glass, glass jar. jar in the mantelpiece. <laughs> <laughs> but the visual effects are amazing because there's one point where one of the people gets out of their jar and then Pretorius takes a pair of pliers and picks him up by the shirt and it looks great. It looks fucking amazing how they fucking pulled that shot up. It's great. Really just groundbreaking. Um, but what happens is Frankenstein doesn't want to do the experiment of creating a bride for the monster, but the monster... With the help of Pretorius, the monster decides to kidnap Frankenstein's wife to get him to do the, the experiment. So that synopsis is pretty wrong. Pretty wrong, man. I don't know where you got that. IMDb. Wrong IMDb. Yeah. Get must out of here. It must have been translated from Russian. Well, it was like the other it, time. So technically, it was the summary gotcha. portion, not the, like that first synopsis. Well, our number one film in the... Monsterverse for Universal's Monsters is The Invisible Man from 1933, which we've been talking glowingly about. Rotten Tomatoes, it's a 94% critic score. Audience is 84%. IMDb, it's a 7.9. A mysterious man whose head is completely covered in bandages wants a room. The proprietors of the pub aren't used to making their house an inn during the winter months, but the man insists. They soon come to regret their decision. The man quickly runs out of money, and he has a violent temper besides... Something that's been cut off in the rest of the sentence. Worse still, he seems to be some kind of chemist and has filled his room with messy chemicals, test tubes, breakers, and the like. When they try to throw him out, they make a ghastly discovery. Basically, he's fucking invisible. <laughs> Meanwhile, Flora Cranley appeals to her father to do something about the mysterious disappearance of Dr. Griffin, his assistant, and her sweetheart. He miss she misses him so much. What's his name? Jack? John? Something like that? I can't remember. Bob. Bob. No, it's something with a J. <laughs> I can't remember. I think it's Jack. Her father's other assistant, the cowardly Dr. Kemp, who's a bitch, is no help. <laughs> he wants her for himself. He's annoying, Dr. Kemp. He is. Dr. Kemp's wicked annoying. But you know, the Invisible Man uses him pretty well. Little does Flora guess that the wild tales from newspapers and radio broadcasts of an invisible homicidal maniac are stories of Dr. Griffin himself, who has discovered the secret of invisibility and gone mad in the process. <laughs> this movie also has amazing action scenes with all the police. There's multiple sequences of, of them trying, of people, groups of people trying to capture and fight the invisible man. Shit's just throwing all over the place. Yeah, and yeah then, invisible and then, stuff. Yeah, and then like there's the the police fight outside of the police building. He like climbs the fence and shit, and really just huge, awesome stunt work and driving the car. But also small stuff, minute stuff like doors opening with probably strings yes. or something like that. Chairs moving. Very That's inventive. not stop motion, but probably some sort of string or invisible apparatus. That while an actor's like he's talking to Kemp in Kemp's office, and the chair moves and moves towards him, and there's weight distributed on it. Very through. creative film. I love it's so theatrical, and it just works, man. There's not a second of this movie where you're just like that looks fake, like so many other old movies that look dated. Like this movie is like, even in the big reveal, like you said earlier, when he takes the bandages off, the big reveal. You want to see who I really am? It's <laughs> awesome. And he's just taking the bandages off his face, and you're like, it looks like they filmed it this year. It looks it's that pretty good. Pretty fucking good. It looks amazing. I love how he, th he throws like four people downstairs. He kills a lot of people. <laughs> but like he just like before killing people, he just tosses them. Get the hell out of here. Get out yeah, of my room. Yeah. He just tosses them downstairs. It's great. <laughs> that poor old lady. She's just trying to like. Oh, she doesn't know what's going on in her inn. Her inn has become a madhouse. She screams like Aunt May. <laughs> oh, Harry Osborne. From evil. Finish it. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Finish it. Finish it. <laughs> Rob <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, man, Invisible Man is the one. It's my favorite. It's pretty fucking great. But there's so many, and they I'm made really, a lot of them. I'm really looking forward to Frankenstein next year with Guillermo del Toro. I hope it comes out in 2024. And other than that, the the Wolfman with if Ryan Gosling and Shafranz get to make that, that would be awesome. To see a hairy Ryan Gosling. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a it would be a heartbreak story shot handheld like Blue Val- Blue Valentine. <laughs> He's playing ukulele. <laughs> I think it'd be a really cool movie. I think Gosling's all for it because he loves weird stuff and he loves horror. What's his band called? He's got the a dead, horror, He's got a horror the dead band. something. They yeah, they put out one album. Yeah, it's it's sort of yeah it's really cool. It's like uh, acoustic r- horror rock, but like it's good, yeah. kid friendly to an extent. Like it's 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 actually catchy. Let me Google it real quick. Ryan Gosling's band. Something bones. Oh um yeah, something bones. And something bones. The bones. Dead man's bones. Dead man's bones. Dead man's bones. That's oh, I name. wrote I wrote Ryan Gosling bad. <laughs> dead, <laughs> you got a bunch of sexy photos. photos. Yeah, bunch of sexy photos. It was, it was a lot. Of, <laughs> it was a lot of place on the pines. <laughs> yeah, dead man's bones is the band. It's cool. It's a yeah, good it's album. Good songs, yeah, I like yeah. it. Yeah, it's catchy. I listened to it for like a, a month. He um, played at the Echoplex in L.A. Did he really? Yeah, they played a, a song. This is before the, he was mega there. famous though. This is like after Drive. It was like 2009, 2010. He was still well. He like he was people knew him, but like he wasn't who he is now. He wasn't fucking Ken. No, he was super famous. He wasn't Ken famous. Well, I'm yeah, but like this was after. I'm pretty sure this was after Drive. Oh, it's since oh 2009. Yeah, you're right. So probably they probably released the album before that movie came out. Maybe who knows? It's just it's funny. It's him playing like he, they played at an outdoor festival, and he's just dressed with like a a white button up in in slacks. It's like it's just like it's still like Gosling style. Just Gosling. Yeah. I'm, well, I'm literally him. So if you need it, it's my band. If you want to know, I can tell you. I can play some of the songs for you. Right literally, now. my band yeah. is called Dead Man's Bones. Yeah, yeah, I have. I have. That's how you knew the name of it, right? Yeah, yeah that's how I knew it because I I formed the band. Why isn't my... it just called Literally Me? Well, I can't name the band Literally Me. It needs a catch. It's a horror band. You okay. See, the whole it. point. I came up. With the What's set. your favorite song in Dead Man's Bones? Probably in, their, in your discography. Um, <laughs> the last song in the album. I can't remember, but it has the chorus of children. There's a bunch of there's like a chorus that they got, like uh-huh. a, a elementary chorus that synced with them. It's cool. In all the songs they did, yeah, exactly. But we'll, we'll name one song. It starts off like this. <laughs> it does start off like that. That's true. <laughs> all right. <laughs> you don't have to uh, think about your past. <laughs> yeah, I put that band behind me, man. This is a long time ago. But anyways, your band are, must be I'm very pissed. excited for some him. of these monster movies, but I still think that Universal doesn't exactly know exactly what they want to do with them. Hence, two vamp, two Dracula movies coming out two months apart with completely different tones and aesthetics and vibes. Were they both Universal? Yeah, the, yeah. They actually they were. Demeter and Renfield were both Universal movies. And they lost money on both of them. A lot of money. Yeah, because they looked really bad. Probably combined, they probably lost 150 mil on these movies, if I was to guess. Oh, man. Just bombs. Well, they made a Dracula movie, and he was just like a bat creature the whole time. And honestly, that movie, The Last Voyage of the Demeter, it's 98% just people talking on a boat. 2% scary scenes with Dracula. Renfield's also supposed to be on the boat. Hardly in it. Renfield's supposed to be on the boat. Is Renfield in that movie? I don't think Renfield. No, no, Renfield's not in it. He's supposed to be if they're... There's um so there's a there's a girl who's the lead I can't remember her name and then so there's a girl and a guy who are leads and she's the one that knows who Dracula like that Dracula's on the boat she's not, the one protecting Dracula there's there's not a Renfield so she's I she's essentially Renfield basically so she's it. the one protecting him yeah because so that's what, Dracula always has someone protecting I wouldn't him. say she's protecting she's trying to warn everybody that there's a vampire on the boat oh okay but also so like she discovers it that movie doesn't make a ton of sense because. All of their food gets killed, like they all the livestock gets killed, and they have no food for this long voyage. But they're like, should we turn back and restock? They're like, no, no, we're good. We're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna die at sea. We have plenty of salt. You're gonna salt. You're gonna starve to death. So they, he kills all the food, and then they're just like, yeah, let's keep going across keep going. the Atlantic. Yeah, like we need to make up last year. It's like a we'll perfect, be good for a couple. It's months. like perfect storm. Like, oh, we didn't have a good haul. <laughs> oh man, it's pretty silly. It's not wicked awesome like not the it. perfect storm. That was, like the trailer is not the movie. The movie's pretty boring. I I don't recommend it. And I love vampire movies and I love Dracula. I love vampire movies. They can be really good. I have a good idea for a Dracula movie. Yeah. I hear Juno meowing outside. 
What's your Dracula idea? Well, I don't want to tell it on the podcast oh, yeah, publicly. We don't spoil it. Someone's going to steal it. I'm not. Well, it's probably not that good of an idea. I'm sure it's great if you came up with it. <laughs> Anyways. We love horror. We love monsters. I'm very excited about some of these again. Some and we've them... done so many modern horror episodes. We wanted to do something different. Yeah, and I we can't recommend checking these movies out enough. Like Dracula, Frankenstein, The Bride of Frankenstein, The Mummy, The, the Wolfman, The Invisible Man. The Invisible Man slaps. That's a good fucking movie. These are all really good movies. Can't recommend them enough. If you've never watched them, they're fast watches. They're easy. They're hour 20, hour 10. Cruise through them. Yeah, just they're black and white, but like, whatever, man. It's still great. Still well made. Also, it's not universal, but Young Frankenstein is amazing. <laughs> amazing. Thank you so much for tuning in to our Universal Monsters episode. We're hoping you're having a great spooky season this year. We're going to wrap up our October on Monday the 30th, the day before Halloween. We're doing an episode on Halloween, John Carpenter's brilliant film from 1978. Cannot wait to do a full episode on it. We figured it would be the perfect thing to do. We've never and, really covered it. Yeah, we'll, we'll dress up for it as well. And, and don't forget, on October 29th, we're going to have a streamathon on our Twitch Raiders Lost podcast. That's our Twitch. You can j follow us right now. We haven't streamed anything yet, but we are going to have our streamathon. We're going to watch seven horror movies in a row starting at 10 a.m. Pacific time and go until 10 p.m. Pacific time. <laughs> October 29th, that's the Sunday before Halloween. Again, Raiders Lost pod on Twitch. Or just search Raiders of the Lost Podcast. You'll find us on Twitch. It's an app that I did not... I thought that Twitch was just muscle spasms, but I guess it's an app for streaming. <laughs> good joke. <laughs> That's a boomer joke. You like That's that? good joke. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. We hope to see you on that stream as well as check out our recent episodes. We've been posting nothing but bangers. See you next time. This episode was executive produced by our chosen one patrons, Cody Moen, Andrew Hagen, Benjamin Cook, Calvin Murphy Griggs, Darian, Tyler McFly, and Sal Koching. Our Chosen One patrons are our biggest supporters. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button as well, notifications for sure. Listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere you can listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out this other content we have on our YouTube channel.